So, Duke of Kent, take it away. King Lear, Act 1, Scene 1. Okay. I thought the king had more effect at the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. Gloucester. It did, it did always seem so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which the dukes he values most. For equalities are so weighed that curiosity neither can make choice or either moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? He's breeding, sir, have been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I'm braised to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, whereupon she grew round wound, and had indeed. Sir, a son for her cradle. She had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have, sir, a son by order of law, some year older than this, who yet is not dearer in my account. Though this knave came something saucy, saucy to the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair. There was a good spot at his mate, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years and always he shall get again. And away he shall again. <laughs> <clears throat> Attend the lords of France and Burgundy and Gloucester. I shall, my lord. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map here, there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our first intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we, unburdened, crawl toward death our son of Cornwall, and you, our no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers that future strife may be prevented now. The two great princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule interest of territory, cares of state, which of you shall we say doth love us most, that we our largest bounty may extend, where nature doth with merit challenge? Goneril, our oldest born, speak first. Sir, I do love you more than words can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space and liberty. Beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life with grace, health, beauty, honour, as much as child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, beyond all manner of so much I love you. <laughs> what shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. <laughs> of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests, and with champagnes rich with plenteous rivers and wide skirted meads, we make thee lady. To thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife of Cornwall? Speak. I am made of that self metal as my sister and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love only. She comes too short. That I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses and find I am alone felicitate in your dear highness love. Poor Cordelia, <coughs> yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. Mm, to thee and thine hereditary ever remain this 
ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Gonroll, but now our joy, although our last and least to those who, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested, uh, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. How? Nothing will come of nothing. Uh, speak again. Unhappy that I am, and cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. How, how, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Good, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as our right fit. Obey you, love you, and must honour you. Why have my sister's husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Ay, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. By truth, then, be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs, from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim my paternal care, propinquity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee for this forever. The barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation, messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good, my liege. Oh, peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight. To be my grave, my peace, as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France. Who stirs? Call Burgundy. Cornwall and Albany, with my two daughters' dowers, digest this th third. Let pride, which she calls plainless, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power. Preeminence and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred knights, and uh, by you shall be sustained, shall, shall our abode make with you by due terms. Only shall we retain the name and the additions to a king, the sway, revenue, execution of the rest. Beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm this coronet part between you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn. Make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. What wouldst thou do, old man? Thinks thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows, to plainness honours bound, when majesty falls to folly? Reserve thy state, and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment, Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are those empty-hearted whose low sound reverbs no holiness. Kent, on thy life, no more. My life I never held but as a pawn, to wage against thy enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being motive. Out of my sight. See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now, by Apollo, now by Apollo, king, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Oh, vassal, miscreant! We got an Albino. We haven't got an Albino in Cornwall. They haven't turned up. Uh, yeah. Someone take the land. Dear sir, forbear. Do kill thy physician, and the fee bestow upon thy foul disease. Revoke thy gift, or whilst I can vent clamour from my throat, 
I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant, on thine allegiance hear me, that thou hast sought to make us break our vows, which we durst never yet, and with strained pride to come betwixt our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear. Our potency made good, take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from diseases of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the next day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, that moment is thy death. Away, by Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Why, fare thee well, king, sit thus thou wilt appear. Freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinks, and hast thou most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds prove, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kent, O princes, bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. Enter Gloucester. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address ourselves towards you, who with this king hath rival for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present dower with her, or cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than as your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right, noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us, we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands, if aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it with our displeasure pleased, and nothing more may fitly like your grace. She's there, and she's yours. I know an answer. Sir, will you with those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes no up in such conditions. Then leave her, sir, for by thy power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you were I hate. Therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is more strange that she, even but now, was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, most best, most dearest. In this trice, this thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. Sure, her offense must be of such a natural degree that monsters it or your forevouched affection fall into taint, which to believe of her must be a faith that reason without miracle could never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I well intend, I'll do it before I speak. But you make known, it is no vicious blot, murder or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor even for want of that which I am richer, a still soliciting eye and such a tongue as I am glad I have not, not to have it hath lost me in your liking. Go to, go to, better thou hast not been born than not to please me better. It is no more but this, is it no more but this a tardiness in nature which often leaves the history and spoke that it intends to do? My lord, what seems not love when it's mingled regards that stands a loop of the entire point? Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. Royal King, give but that portion which yourself proposed. And here I take Cordelia by the end, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn. I am firm. I am sorry, then, you have so lost a father, that you must lo lose a husband. Peace be with Burgundy. Since that respects and fortunes are his love, I shall not be his wife. Most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, and most despised. And thy virtues here I seize upon. 
be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Gods, gods, it is strange that from their cold, coldest neglect, my love should kin to inflame like my dullest daughter, king, grown to chance, is in our fair France. Not all the dukes of waterish Burgundy can buy this and prize precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind, thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast her, France, let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our venison. Come, noble Burgundy. Bid farewell, bid farewell to your sisters. Jewels of our father, with washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know you what you are, and like a sister am most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well our father. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duty. Let be your study be to content your Lord, who hath received you at fortune's arms. You have obedience scanted, and are well worth the wants that you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides, who covers faults at last with shame derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister, it is not a little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. He always loved us the most, and with that poor judgment he has now cast her off appears too grossly. grossly. It is the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath but been rash. There must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long engrafted condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring to them. Such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of Kemp's banishment. There is further compliment of leave taking between France and him, pray you, let's sit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall think further on it. We must do something, and in the heat. Enter Edmund the Bastard with a letter. Who's Edmund? Thou, nature, art my goodness. To thy law my service are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of Cosmond and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother. Why, busters? Wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous, and my shape as true, as honest madame's issues. Why brand their earth with base, with baseness, bastardry, base, base? Who in the lustry stills of nature take more composition of and fierce quality than thus within a jewel, stale, tired bait, go to scraving a whole tribe of folks, got treed asleep and awake? Well then, Legitimate Edgar, I must have your land, or father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention three, Edmund's base shall not legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now God stand up for bastards. Gloucester? <laughs> Kent banished thus, and France did shook parted, and the king gone tonight prescribed this, his power, confined to exhibition, all this done upon the glad. Edmund, how now? What news? So please, your lordship, 
Noon. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No, what needed then? What terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such needed to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need it. Needs be uh, I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have no all uh, read. And for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your uh, looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend. Either do detain of give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification. He wrote this but as an essay to or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of, my, of age makes the world bitter to the best of our time, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I began to find an idol and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny. Who sways not as it has power, but as it is suffered? Come to me, that of this, I may speak more of our father. If our father would speak till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved, beloved of your brother, Edgar. Hmm. Conspiracy. Sleep till I wake him. You should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar, had he a hand to write this, a heart to, and brain to breed it in. When came this to you, who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There is a cunning of it. I found it thrown in the casement of my closet. You know the character to be yours, your brother's. If the matter were good, my lord, I just swear it were is. It were is. But in respect of that, I will fain think it were not. It is his. It is his end, my lord. But I hope his art is not in the contents. Oh, we're somewhere in Act One. <laughs> Are you free? Are you free? Come into, come, come into, guys. Cluster in. Cluster. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him of maintaining it to be, if it that. Sons at perfect age and father declined. The father shall be as words to the son, and the son manage his retinue. O villain, villain, his very opinion in the letter, abhorred villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Go, sir, I'll seek him. I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain. Where is he? I do not well know, my, lo my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you shall run a certain course where if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it will make great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the art of the obedience. I dare pawn down my leaf 
for him that he has brought this to feel my affection, to your honor, and to no other pretense of danger. Thank you, so. If you honor judge, it's me. I will place you where you shall hear a scoffment of this end, and by an auricular assurance of your satisfaction. And that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not, sure. To his father, that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth, Edmund, seek him out. Win me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would instate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey his business as I shall find means, and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us, though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus. Yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love calls, friendship falls off, brothers divide in cities. Mutinies in countries discord. In places treason and the bond crack. Twix son and father, this villain of mine comes under the prediction. There's son against father, the king falls from buyers of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, ho hollowness, treachery, all in ruinous discord follows us disquently into our grave. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully, and the noble and true heart hearted Kent banished his offence honestly. Tis strange, tis strange. Okay, I've just lost my script. There's an opportunity here to welcome uh, Stefan Smart, who's the <laughs> going to play uh, Duke of Albany, is it? Is, yeah. Uh, you might have to pick something else up. We've got Edmund and Edgar. Are they the same person at the moment? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were opposite extremes. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Ed Edmund's Thomas and I'm Edgar. Are you? Okay, sorry. Okay. We do need a Duke of Cornwall and an Oswald. I'm an Oswald already, I think. Oh, great. Okay, good. Um, I've just lost my script. My window just suddenly closed, but I found it now. Ah! Oh, sorry. My connection is bad. Okay. Quick breather. So, uh, what, what, what page are we on? Page five of scene two. Have just left. So it's my turn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is the excellent foppery of the words that when we are sick in fortune, often the surface of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains by necessity, fools by even the compulsion. Knaves, thieves, and treasures by, by spherical predominance, drinkers, guards, and adulterers by an offer's obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. An admirable evasion of poor Western man to lay his goodish disposition to the church of star. My father computed with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it, that it follows I am root and licious. Who you root. are? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, carry on. <laughs> continue, continue. But I should have been that I am. 
at the middle starts in the firmament, twinkle on my bastarding Edgar. Yeah. You, you continue. Sorry. And Patton's crew becomes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sight like Tom or Bethlehem. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Far so let me. How oh, now, Brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? I am seeking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? Do you busy yourself about that? I promise you, the effects it writes of success, of success and happily, as of unnaturalness between the child and the parents, death, thirst, dissolutions of ancient amities, division in state, menaces and maledictions against king and nobles, needles deficiencies, punishment of friends, dissipation of court, material breaches, and I know not, not what. How long have you been a, a, a sectary astronomical? Come, come, when saw you my father last. Why, the, the night gone by? Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms. Found you not dis displeasure Found you not displeasure in him by word and countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself, William, you may have offered him, and at my entreaty forbid, forbear his presence till some little time has qual qualified the ease of this displeasure, which at this instance the regular in him that with the mischief of your person and will scurrily allow. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my loading. From Wednesday, I will fiercely bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray go. There is my key. If you do steer abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. Go armed. I'm no honest man, if there be any good meaning towards you. I've told you what I have seen and heard, but fancy nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you, away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in the business. A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, and who is foolish and honestly, my practice is right easy. easy. I see the business. Let me, if not be burst, have lens by wit. All with me is meat that I can fish and fit. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Aye, madam. By day and by night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross chime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow righteous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come, slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He's coming, madam, I hear him. Put on what weary negligences you please, you and your fellow servants, or I'll have it come to question. If he distaste it, let him to your sister, whose mind and mine I know in that are one. Not to be overruled, idle old man, that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now by my life, old fools are babes again, and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused. Remember what I have said. Well, madam. And let his knights 
<laughs> have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter. Advise your fellow so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Go prepare for dinner. If but as well I other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raised my likeness. Now banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labours. <laughs> Oh, let me not stay a dot for dinner. Go get it ready. Who's Kent? No, no, you say it. Oh, sorry. How now? What art thou? What art thou? A man, sir. What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly that will put me in trust to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. Sorry. What art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. If thou beest as poor for a subject as he's for a king, thou art poor enough. What wouldst thou? Service. What wouldst thou serve? You. <laughs> Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir, but you have that in your countenance which I would fain call master. Mm, what's that? Authority. What service does canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a cautious tale in telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, nor so old to dote on her for anything. I have years on my back, forty-eight. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. Dinner, ho, oh, dinner, where's my knave, my fool? Go you and call my fool hither. <laughs> you, you, sirrah, where's my daughter? Sir, is you. What says the fellow there? Call the clock pole back. Where's my fool, ho? I think the world's asleep. Uh, uh, oh no, what's, where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. I came not the slave back to you when I called him. Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. Uh, he would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence as in the duke himself also, and your daughter. Hmm, sayest thou so? I beseech you pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wronged. Thou but rememberst, rememberst me of mine own conception, I have perceived a most faint neglect of late which I have rather blamed as mine own jealousy, curiosity, than as very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it. But where's that my, my fool? I have not seen him these two days. Since my young lady is going into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Do you call hither my fool? Oh, you, sir. C come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's knave, you whoresome dog. You slave, you cur. I am none of these, sir. I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? I'll not be struck in, my lord. Nor tripped neither, you base football player. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of Nate, which late, which I have rather... Oh, have I just lost a page? No, you good. You good. Um, blamed as mine own jealousy, curi curiosity, no. then as a very pretense of purpose We've of unkindness. No, it seems to be the same thing. Oh. 
it's just a double page. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well spotted. <laughs> Someone's paying attention. <laughs> the page is there twice. Okay, so the base football player, that's a great quote, isn't it? <laughs> I thank thee, fellow, thou servest me and I'll love thee. Come, sir, arise, away. I'll teach you differences. Away, away. If you will measure your lover's length again, tarry. But away, go to. Have you wisdom? So. Now, my friendly knave, I, knave, I thank thee. Uh, there's earnest of thy service. Am I reading this? Yes, Cordelia, you better read okay. before. Okay, let me hire him too. It's my coxcomb. How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Tira, you are best to take my coxcomb. Why, fool? Why? Taking one's part that's out of favour? Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits, thou'll catch cold shortly. Eh, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two of his daughters, and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How now, uncle? Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Take another of thy daughters. Take heed, Sarah. The whip. Who's the dog that must be a kennel? He must be whipped out. The lady breath may stand by the fire and stink. A pestilent gall to me. Sarah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, uncle. Have more than thou showest. Speak less than thou knowest. Lend less than thou owest. Ride more than thou goest. Learn more than thou trowest. Set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink in thy whore, and keep at the door. And thou shalt have more than two tens to a score. This is nothing, fool. It is like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. You make no use of nothing, uncle. Why, I know, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Prithee, tell him so much the rent of his land comes to. Do not believe a fool. A bitter fool. Does thou know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet fool? No, lad, teach me. A lord that counselled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. With after him stand, the sweet and bitter fool will presently appear, one in Motley here and the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away that thou wast born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. No, Faith. Lords and great men will not let me. If I had a monopoly out, I would have part on. And ladies, too. Will not let me have all fool to myself. I'll be snatching. Give me an egg, Uncle, and I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why? After I have cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, two crowns of the egg. <laughs> when thou clovest my crown in the middle and givest away both parts, pourest thine ass on the back of the dirt. Thou hadst little wit in thy broad crown when thou gavest thy golden one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be whipped that first finds it so. Fools had never less wit than a year. The wise man again. I'm not singing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the tune. <laughs> Fools had never less wit than a year, for wise men are grown foppish. Thou knows not how their wits to wear, manners are so apish. When were you wont to be so full of songs, Sarah? I have used it, Uncle, ever since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers. For when thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches. Nay, for sudden joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung, that such a king should play bo-peep and go the fools among. Queen Uncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. And you lie, Sarah, we'll have you whipped. I marvel what pin thou and thy daughters are. They have me whipped for speaking true, they have me whipped for lying, and sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. I would rather be any kind of thing than a fool, and yet I would not be thee, uncle. Thou hast paired thy wit on both sides and left nothing in the middle. Here comes one of thy pairings. <laughs> How now, daughter, what makes that frontlet on? Methinks you are too much of late in the frown. Thou oh, wast a pretty fellow when that hast no, no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art an O without a figure. I'm better than thou art now. I'm a fool. Thou art nothing. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue. Say your face bids me, you say nothing. Mum, mum, 
he that keeps no cross no crumb, weary of all shall want come. For the shell peace cod. Not only, sir, this is your all licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I have thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance, which if you should the fault would not escape censure nor the redress sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might it in their working do you that offence, which else were shame that their necessity will call discreet proceeding. You know, Uncle, the hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it's had its head bit off by its young. So out went the candle, and we were all left darkling. Are you our daughter? Come, sir, I would you make use of that good wisdom whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions of late trans of the late transform you from what you rightly are. May not an ass know when the cart draws the horse? Oh, God, I love thee. <laughs> Does any here know me? Why, this is not Lear. Doth Lear walk thus, speak thus? Where are his eyes? Either his notion weakens or his discernings are lethargied. Ha, ah, sleeping or waking? Sure, it is not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Lear's shadow. I would learn that, for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge and reason, I should be pers false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair gentlewoman? This admiration, sir, is much of the savour of, of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes are right. As you are old and reverend, should be wise. How do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this court infected with their manners shows like righteous inn? Epicurism and lust make it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself does speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to the quantity of your train, and rem remainder that shall still depend to be such men as may besought your age, which know themselves and you. <laughs> Darkness and devils! Saddle my horses, call my train together, degenerate bastard! I'll not trouble thee, yet I have. Have I left a daughter? You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Woe that too late repent! Oh, oh, sir, are you come? Uh, is it your will? Speak, sir, prepare my horses. In gratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou show'st the inner child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. Oh, most small fault. How ugly didst thou in Cordelia show when, like an engine, wretched my frame, wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drew from my heart all love and added to the gall. Oh, Leah, 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 beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. My lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Here, nature, here, dear goodness, here, goddess, here. Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honour her. If she must teem, create a child of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart, disnatured torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefit her laughter and contempt that she may feel, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is 
to have a thankless child. Away! Away! Now, gods that we adore, where of comes this? Never afflict yourself to know more of it, but let his disposition have the scope that dotage gives it. Dotage gives it. What? Fifty of my followers at a clap within a fortnight? What's the matter, sir? I'll tell thee, life and death, I am ashamed that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus, that these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them. Blasts and fogs upon thee. The untented woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Old fond eyes beweep this cause again. Ah, oh, pluck ye out and cast you with the waters that you loose to temper clay. Yea, is it come to this? Ha, oh, let it be so. I have another daughter, uh -huh, whom I am sure is kind and comfortable. When she shall hear of this of thee, with her nails shall flay thy wolvish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume, I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I have cast off forever. Thou shalt, I warrant thee. Do you mark that, my lord? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, to the great love I bear you. Pray be content. Come, sire, no more. Watch Oswald her. You, sir. More knave than fool, after your master. Uncle Lear, Uncle Lear, tarry and make the fool with thee. A fox and one has caught her, and such a daughter is short of the slaughter. My cap would buy a halter, so the fool follows after. This man hath good counsel, a hundred knights. Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred knights, yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, he may guard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say. Well, you may fear too far. Safer than trust too far. Let me still take away the harms I fear, not fear still to be taken. I know his heart, that he hath uttered, I have writ my sister, if she sustain him and his hundred knights, when I have showed the unfitness. You're Oswald as well, I think, Seth. Yeah, okay. Um, I've not got this line. I, madam, is what I've got. How now, Oswald? What have you writ that letter to my sister? I, madam. Take you company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear and thereto add such reason of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone and hasten your return. No, no, my lord, though I condemn not yet under pardon, you are much more a task for want of wisdom than praised for harmless, harmful mind mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Nay, then. Well, well, the event. <coughs> Go you before to Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know that comes from her demand out of the letter. Uh, if your dil diligence be not speedy, I shall be there before you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered your letter. The man's brain rinse heels. We are not in danger of kipes. Ay, boy. And I pray thee, be merry. The witch shall never be slip the witch shall never go slipshod. <laughs> Shalt see thy other daughter will use thee kindly. Although she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. Why, what canst thou tell, my boy? She will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle of one's face. No. Why, to keep one's eyes on either side's nose. What a man cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes his shell? No. Nor I neither. I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why, puts head in. Not to give it away to his daughters, and leave his horns without a case. I will forget my nature. So kind a father. Be my horses ready? My asses are gone about him. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not eight? Yes, indeed. 
or to make a good fool? To take to gain perforce monster ingratitude. If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not be, have been old, and <laughs> thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me be not mad. Not mad, sweet heaven. I would not be mad. Keep me in temper, I would not be mad. How oh, now? Are the horses ready? Sorry, that's me again, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, how now? Are the horses ready? Yeah, you ready, can... my lord. Come, boy. He that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long unless things be cut shorter. Save thee, Curran. Curran. Ah, now somebody. Isn't, oh. isn't there somebody supposed to play Curran? Okay, I will. Okay. And you, sir. And you, sir, I have been with your father and given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his Duchess, will be here with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Note I, pray you, what are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward twixt the two Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do then in time. Fare you well, sir. The Duke be here tonight. The better, best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father has said words to take my brother. And I have one thing of a crazy question, which I, am, which I must act. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word. Listen, brother, I say. My father watches. Oh, sir, why is this place? Intelligence is given where you are. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Colonel Oat? He is coming eater. Now, I night eight asked and began with the And Regan with him. Have you nothing to say upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I'm sure, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw. Seem to defend yourself. Now quit your will. Yield. Come before my father. Light. Ho. Oh, here. Fly, brother, fly! Torches, torches! So, farewell. Some blue drone on my wool began opinion of my more fierce endeavor. Cuts his own arm. <laughs> I have, yes, I have seen drag oars do more than this in sport. Father, father! Stop, stop! No help! Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. Close to her. Where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Is the villain Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when by no means he could. Pursue him. Ho, go after. Yeah, just carry on, Edmund. Yeah. Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. But that I told him the revenge in God, against Parisid did all the thunder bend. Spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was born to his father. Sir, in fine, seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose in fell motion, 
with his prepared sword, he charges home. My unprepared body latched my arm. And when he saw my best alluring spirits, bold in the quiet right, rose to the encounter. Or whether gusted my, by the noise I made, for suddenly he fled. Let him not in this land shall he remain uncaught and found dispatch. The, no the noble duke, my master, my worthy art and patron, come tonight. By his authority, I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward state, he that concealed When I dissuaded him from his intent, and found him pitch to do it with cursed speech, I threatened to discover him. He replied, Though unpossessing bastards, dost thou think, if I would stand against thee, would the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worse in thee make my words faced? No. What I should deny? I this I would, eh, though, though this produced my very character, I had turned it all to, the, to thy suggestion, plot, and damn practice, and thou must make a door of the word. If they not though the prophets of my death were very pregnant of potation spirits to make thee seek it. O oh, strange and fast and villain. Would he deny the, his letter, said he. I never got him. Hark the Duke's trumpet, I know not why he comes. All ports I bar. The villain shall not escape. The Duke must grant me that, besides his picture, I will send far and near, that all the kingdom may have the due note of him. And of my land, loyal and natural boy, I work the means to make capable. Who's going to be Cornwall? Maybe Albany can be Cornwall. Okay. How now, my noble friend, since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named, your Edgar? O oh, lady, O oh, lady, shame would have it him. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that turned upon my father? I know not, madam. Tis too bad, too bad. Yes, madam. He was of that consort. No marvel then, though he were ill affected. Tis they have put him on the old man's death, to have the expense and spoils of his revenues. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them, and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. It was my duty, sir. He did bray his practice and received this hurt you see striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? I, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. Make your own purpose how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself, you <clears throat> shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir. Truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you? Thus out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions noble Gloucester of some poise, where we, where we must have use of your advice. Our father he hath writ, so hath our sister, of differences which I least thought it fit to answer from our home. The several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend, lay comfort to your bosom, and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves the instant use. 
I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Good dawning to thee, friend. Out of this house? Aye. Where may we set our horses? In the mirror. My so thee, thou loves me? Tell me. English, Mr. Um, I love thee not. Why then? I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury pinfold, I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken feet, a bait, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy-worsted, stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking knave, a whore son, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that would be a board in a way of good service, and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, panda, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch. One whom I will beat into glamouring and quieting <laughs> the nice least syllable of thy addition. My Boy, what a monstrous fellow art thou, thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced valet art thou to deny thou knowest me. Is it two days ago since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Draw, you rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines. I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you. Shh. Draw, you whore son, cullingly barber monger. Draw. No way, I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal. You come with letters against the king and take vanity, the puppet's part against the royalty of her father. Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal, come your ways. Help, ho, murder, help. Strike, you slave. Stand, rogue. Stand, you neat slave. Strike. How, oh, how, oh, what's the matter, part? With you, good man boy, if you please. Come, old fleshy, come on, young master. Weapons, arms, what's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in breath, my lord. No marble, you have so bestirred your valour. You cowardly rascal, nature disclaims in thee, a tailor made thee. Thou art a strange fellow, a tailor made man. Aye, a tailor, sir. A stone cutter or painter could not have made him so ill, though there had been but two years on the trade. Speak yet, how grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared and suit of his grey beard. Thou whore son, Zed, thou unnecessary letter. My lord, if you will give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar and daub the walls of a jakes with him. Spare my grey beard, you wagtail. Peace, sir, you beastly knave. Know you no reverence? Yes, sir, but anger hath the privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this would wear a sword who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, oft bite the holy cords at twain, which are too intrinsic to unloose, smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel. Bring oil to the fire, snow to the colder moods, rene uh, affirm and turn their halicorn beaks with every gale and berry of their masters, knowing naught like dogs but following. A plague upon your epileptic visage. Smile, you, my speeches, as I were a fool. <laughs> and I had you upon Sarum Plain. I drive thee cackling home to Camelot. What, art thou mad, old fellow? How fell you out, say that? No contraries hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. No more perchance does mine, nor his, nor hers. Sir, tis my occupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness, and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter he. An honest mind and plain he must speak truth. 
and they they will take it so if not he's plain these kind of maze i know which in this plainness harbour more craft and more corrupt ends than twenty silly duckling observants that stretch their duties nicely sir in good faith or in sincere verity under the allowance of your great aspect whose influence like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering phoebus's front what means by this to go out of my dialect which you sir, which you di discommend so much i know sir i am no flatterer he that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave which for my part i will not be though i should win your displeasure to entreat me to it and what was the offence you gave him? I never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very late, to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him, got traces of the king for him, a Tepton, who was self-subdued, and in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again none of these rogues and cowards but ajax is their fool fetch forth the stocks you stubborn ancient knave you reverend braggart we'll teach you sir i am too old to learn call not your stocks for me i serve the king on whose employment i was sent to you you shall do small respect show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master stocking his messenger Fetch forth the stocks, as I have life and honour, there shall be, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord, and all night too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Let me beseech your grace not to do so his fault is much and the good king his master will check him for tea your purposed low correction is such a base it and contend wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with the king his master he must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs. Put in his legs. Come, my lord, away. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray you do not, sir. I have watched and travelled hard. Some time I shall sleep out. The rest, I'll whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. Shall be ill taken. Good king that must approve the common saw, thou out of heaven's benediction comest to take the warm sun. Approach, thou beacon, to this underglow. That be, by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I know it is from Cordelia, who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state seeking to give losses their remedies. All weary and overwatched shall take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more, turn thy wheel. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree, escape of the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself, and I have thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury and contempt of man brought near to beast. My face are grimed with filth. Thank it, my loins. Elf or my hair in knots, but with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who with roaring voices 
striking their numbered and mortified bare arms, pins, wooden picks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. And with this horrible odd lot from low farms, poor pelting villages, cheap cuts and mills, some, sometimes with lunatic bands, sometimes with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Turley God, poor Tom. That's something yet. Edgar, I nothing can. Laurence Olivier. It's strange that they should say depart from home and not send back my messenger. <laughs> As I learned the night before, there was no purpose in them of this remove. Hail to thee, noble master. Ah, makest thou this shame thy pastime? <laughs> oh, my lord. Look, he wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the heads, dogs and bears by the neck, monkeys by the loins, and men by the legs. When a man's over lusty at legs, he wears wood and nether stock. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. <coughs> no, I say. I say, yea. No, no, they would not. Yes, they have. By Jupiter, I swear, no. By Juno, I swear, I. They dares not do it. They could not, would not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness's letters to them, ere I was taken from the place that, sh that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril, his mistress' salutations, delivered letters spite of intermission, which presently they read, on whose contents they summoned up their mani mani straight to a course, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer, gave me cold looks, and meeting here the other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet, if the wild geese fly that way. Fathers that wear rags do make their children blind, but fathers that wear bags shall see their children kind. Fortune, that arrant whore, ne'er turns the key to the poor. But for all this thou shalt have as many dollars for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart! Hysterica passio down thy cloud climbing sorrow, thy elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not, stay here. Made you no more offence, but what do you speak of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a train? Thou hast been set in the stocks for that question. Hast well deserved it. Why, fool? will set thee to school to an ant, teach thee there's no labouring in the winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men. And there's not a nose among twenty that can, can, smell, can smell him that's stinking. Let go thy hold when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following it. But the great one that goes up the hill, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That sir which serves and seeks for gain, and follows but perform, will pack when it begins to rain, and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise man fly. Knave turns fool that runs away, fool no knave puddy. Where learned you this, fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Deny to speak with me, they are sick. They are weary. They have travelled all night, mere fetches. Aye, 
the images of revolt and flying off. Fetch me a better answer. My dear Lord, you know the fiery quality of the Duke. Now under removable and fixed he is in his own cause. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery, what qualify why Gloucester, Gloucester, I speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Inform them? Dost thou understand me, man? Aye, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would, with his daughter, speak commands ten service. Are they in informed of this, my breath and blood? Fiery, the fiery duke? Tell the hot duke that Lear, no, but not yet, Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office, whereto our health is bound. We are not ourselves, when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body. I, I, I forbear, and I'm fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Hmm. Death on my state. Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go tell the Duke and his wife I'd speak with them. Now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me. Or uh, at their chamber door, I'll beat the drum till it cries sleep to death. I would have all world betwixt you. Oh me, my heart, my rising heart. Put down. Cry to it, Nuncle. As the cockney did to the eels when she put him in the paste alive. She napped him of the coxcombs with a stick and cried, Down, wantons, down! It was her brother that, in pure kindness to his horses, buttered his hay. Excuse me, I've got about the eels. Hmm? Uh, good morrow to you both. Yes, good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. I am glad to see your highness. Regan, I think you are. I know that reason, I have to think so. If thou should not be glad, I would divorce me from thy mother's womb, sepulchring and adulteress. Oh, are you free some other time for that? Beloved Regan, thy sister's naught. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp toothed gun kindness like a vulture here. Here, I can scarce speak to thee. Thou art not relieved with how depraved a quality. Oh, Regan. I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to stamp her duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. If, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. My curses on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of his confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to your sister you do make return. Say you have wronged her, sir. Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how this becomes the house? Dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. Oh, my knees, I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Oh. Never, Regan, she hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue most serpent-like upon my very heart. All the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ungrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Fly, sir, fly! You nimble lightnings, dart your binding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fen such fogs drawn by the powerful sun to fall and blister. Oh, the blessed gods! So will you wish on me when the rash mood is on? No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender, hafted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. 
her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. Tis not in thee to crudge my pleasures, and to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, Jews of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot, wherein I thee endowed. Good sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know it, my sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the thick old grace of her he follows. Out, varlet, from my sight. What means your grace? Who stopped my servant? Regan? I have good hope thou didst not know on it. Who comes here? Oh, heavens! If you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. Art now ashamed, not ashamed to look upon this beard? Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you yet hold? How can my man and how came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir. But his own disorders deserved much less to advancement. You? It's you? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her and fifty men dismissed. No, rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to be comrade with the wolf and owl to wage against the enmity of the air. Necessity's sharp pinch. Return with her. Ay, the hot-blooded flower of France, that dowless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne, and squire-like pension beg to keep base life afoot. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. Now I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will. I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst. Be better at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so, sir. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so. But she knows what she does. Is this well spoken now? I dare avouch it, sir. What, fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you mm. need of more? Yea, or so many, sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number? How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. Why may not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all! And in good time you gave it. Made you by, by, by guardians, by depositaries? Kept a reservation to be followed with such a number? What Must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan, said you so? And speak it again, my lord. No more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favoured when others are more wicked. Not being the worst stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. Thy, thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice our love. 
Hear me, my Lord, what need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, you heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you guards, a poor old man as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stir these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you both, that all the world shall. I will do such things, what they are yet I know not, but that they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a thousand floors, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad! Let us withdraw, twill be a storm. This house is little. The old man and his people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame, hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So am I purposed. Where is my Lord of Gloucester? Followed the old man forth. <coughs> ah, he's returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls to horse, but will I know not whither? The best to give him way. He leads himself. My Lord, Entreat him by no means today. Alack, the night comes on, and the high winds do sorely ruffle. For many miles about, there's a scarce a bush. Oh, sir, to willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors. He is attended with a desperate train, and what they may incense him to, being apt to have his ear abused, wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord. Tis a wild night. My Regan counsels well. Come out of the storm. <clears throat> Who's there besides foul weather? Who's there? For all the gentlemen, aren't you, Monica? Um, oh, I'll be oh, with pleasure. <laughs> um, one minded like the weather, most unquietly. I know you. Where's the king? Contending with the fretful elements. Bids the winds blow the earth into the sea, or swell the curled water above the main, that things might change or cease. Tears his white hair, which the impetuous blasts with eyeless rage catch in their fury and make nothing of. Strives in his little world of man to outscorn the to and froing conflicting wind and rain. This night, wherein the cub drawn bear would couch, the lion and the belly pinched wolf keep their fur dry. Unbonneted, he runs and bids what will take all. Who is with him? None but the fool, who labours to outjest his heart-struck injuries. Sir, I do know you, and dare upon the warrant of my note commend a dear thing to you. There is division, although as yet the face of it be covered with mutual cunning betwixt Albany and Cornwall, who have, as who have not their, that their great star's throne and set high, Servants who see no less, which are to France the spies and speculations intelligent of our state. What hath been seen, either in snuffs and packings of the dukes, or the hard rain which both of them have borne against the old kind king, or something deeper, whereof perchance these are but furnishings. But true it is, from France there comes a power into this scattered kingdom, who already, wise in our negligence, have secret feet in some of our best ports, and are at point to show their open banner. Now to you. If on my credit you dare build so far to make your speed to Dover, you shall find some that will thank you, making just report of how unnatural and bemadding sorrow the king hath caused to plain. 
I am a gentleman of blood and breeding, and, some, and from some knowledge and assurance offer this office to you. I will talk further with you. No, do not. For confirmation that I am much more than my outlaw, open this purse and take what it contains. If ye shall see Cordelia, as fear not, but you shall, show her this ring, and she will tell you what fellow is that yet you do not know. Fire on this storm, I will go and seek the king. Give me your hand. Have you no more to say? Few words, but to effect more than all yet. That when we have found the king, in which you're plain that way, all this, he that first lights on him, hollow the other. Ah! The winds, and crack your cheeks, rage blow, you cataract and hurricanoes, spout till you have drenched our steeples. Drown the cocks, you sulfurous and thought executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head, and thou, O oh, shaking thunder, smite flat the thick rotundity of the world. Crack nature's moulds, O oh, German, spill at once that make ungrateful man. Oh, Nuncle. Bought holy water in a dry house is better than this rainwater out of door. Good uncle, in. Ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a knight pities neither wise man nor fool. Rumble thy belly full, spit, fire, spout, rain. No rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom. I called you children, you owe me no subscription. Why then let fall your horrible pleasure? Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers that will with two pernicious daughters join your high agenda battles against a head so old and white as this. Oh, tis foul. He that has a house to put his head in has a good headpiece. A codpiece that will house before the head has any head and he shall lose. So beggars marry many. The man that makes his toe what he his heart should make shall of a corn cry woe and turn his sleep to wake. For there never was yet fair woman but she made mouths in a glass. No, I will be the pattern of all patience. I will say nothing. Who's there? Marry, his grace and a codpiece. That's a wise man and a fool. Alas, sir, are you here? Things that love night love not such nights. Oh, sorry, that's you. Leah. Leah. Sorry, I'm mad. Oh, <laughs> oh, I took the words right out of my mouth, sir. <laughs> Gallow the very wanderers of the dark and make them keep their caves. Since I was man, such sheets of fire, such bursts of horrid thunder, such groans of roaring wind and rain, I never remember to have heard. Man's nature cannot carry the affliction nor the fear. Let the great gods that keep this dreadful putter utter over our heads. Find out their enemies now. Tremble, thou wretch, that hast within thee undivulged crimes, unwhipped of justice. Hide thee, thou bloody hand, thou perjured, and thou similar man of virtue. Thou art incestuous, caticative, the pieces shake, that under covert and convenient seeming have practised on man's life, close pent-up guilts, Arrive your concealing con continence and cry these dreadful summoners grace. I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Alack, bareheaded. Gracious, my lord, hard by here is a hobble. Some friendship will it lend you against the tempest. Repose you there while I to this hard house, more harder than the stones whereof tis raised, which even but now demanding after you denied me to come in, return and force their scanted courtesy. Um, my wits begin to turn. Come, oh, my boy. How does my boy? Art cold? I'm cold myself. 
Where is this straw, my fellow? The heart of our necessities is strange that can make my vile things precious. Come, you are awful. Poor fool and knave, I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. Just imagine I'm singing. He that has in a little tiny wit, with hey ho, the wind and the rain, must make content with his fortunes fit, for the rain it raineth every day. Oh, true, my good boy. Come, bring us to this hobble. This is a brave knight to call a courtesan. I'll speak a prophecy ere I go. When priests are more in word than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles, nobles are their tailors' tutors, no heretics burned but wenches' suitors, when every case in law is right, no squire in debt, nor no poor knight, when slanders do not live in tongues, nor cut purses come not throngs, when usurers tell their gold of the field, and boards and whores go churches build, shall the realm of Albion come to great confusion. Then comes the time who lives to see it, the going shall be used with feet. The prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. Alack, alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing when I desire their lead that I might pity him. They took me, they took from me the use of my own house, charged me on pain of their perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him, entreat for him, nor any ways to stain him. Most savage and unnatural. Go to say you nothing. There's a division betwixt the dukes, and a worse matter than that I have received a letter this night. Tis dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There's part of a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will look to him and prevail, uh, prevail him, relieve him. Go, go you and maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not for him perceived. If he asks for me, I am ill and gone to bed, though I die for it, as no less is threatened me. The king, my old master, leave. There is some strange thing toward Edmund. Pray you be careful. This court say forbid thee, shall the duke instantly know, and of that letter too. This seems a fair deserving, and must draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old does fall. Here is the place, my lord. Good, my lord. Enter. The tyranny of the open night's too rough for nature to endure. Let me alone. Good, my lord. Enter here. Will break my heart. I had rather break mine own. Good, my lord, enter. Thou think tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin, so tis to thee. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. Thou'd shun a bear. But if thy flight lay toward the raging sea, thou'd meet the bear in the mouth. When the mind's free, the body's delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats here, filial ingratitude. Is it not that this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home, nor I know I will weep no more in such a night to shut me out. Pour on! <laughs> I will endure in such a night as this. Oh, Regan, Goneril, your kind old father, whose frank heart gave all. Oh, that way madness lies. It, 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 let me shun that. No, 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 no more of that. Good, my lord, enter here. Prithee, go in thyself. Take thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go, I'll go in. I, in, boy, go first. You houseless poverty. Nay, get thee, get thee in, I'll pray, and then I'll sleep. Poor naked wretches, 
wheresoe'er you are, and bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I obtain too little care of these. Take physic. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel, that thou may shake the super, super flux to them and show the heavens more just. Fathom and a half. Fathom and a half. Poor Tom. I'm not in here, Uncle. He's a spirit. Help me, help me. Give me thy hand. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble there in the straw? Come forth. Uh, my lord. Uh, it's repeating that page, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go a bit more. This has happened a few times. Oh, yeah. Away! The foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp portal. Through the sharp, through the sharp portal flows the cold wind. Hum. Go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy two daughters? And art thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom? Whom the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through ford and through whirlypool, erbog and quagmire, that have laid knives under his pillow, and halters in his pew, set ratsbane by his porridge, mm. made him proud at heart to ride on a bay trotting horse over four inch bridges to court his own shadow for a traitor. Bless thy five wits. Tom's a cold. Oody. Oh, do dee do dee. Bless thee from wild winds, star blasting and taking. Do poor Tom's, do poor Tom some charity, whom the soul foul fiend vexes. There could I have him now, and, and there, and, and there again, and there. What, has his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Wouldst thou give them all? Nay, he reserved a blanket, as we'd all been saved. All been shamed. Now all the plagues that in the pendulous air hang fated o'er men's faults, light on thy daughters. He hath no daughters, sir. Death, traitor, nothing could have subdued nature to such a loneness, but it is unkind daughters. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh? Do this as punishment. Twas, twas this fresh, though beget those pelican daughters. Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. <laughs> allow, allow, Lulu. This cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. Take heed of the foul fiend. Obey thy parents. Keep thy words justice, swear not. Commit not with man's sworn spouse. <laughs> Set not thy sweetheart on proud array. Tom's a cold. What, what hast thou been? A serving man. Proud in heart and mind. That curled my hair, wore gloves in my cap, served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did the act of, of darkness with her, swore as many oaths as I spake words, and broke them in the sweet face of heaven, one that slept in the contriving of lust, and wait to do it. <gasps> Wine loved I deeply, dice dearly, and in woman out paramoured the Turk. Fault of heart, Light of ear, bloody of hand, hog in sloth, fox in stealth, wolf in greediness, dog in madness, lion in prey. Let not the creaking of shoes nor the, the rustling of silks betray thy poor heart to woman. Keep thy foot out of brothels, thy hand out of plackets, thy pen from lender's books, and defy the foul fiend. Still, through the hawthorn blows the cold wind, say, Moon, noni. Tophin, my boy, my boy, they say, let him trot by. Why, thou wert better in thy grave than to answer with thy uncovered body the, this extremity of the skies. Is man no more than this? Consider him well, thou erst. <coughs> thou erst the worm no silk. The beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. 
Ah, here's three on a, a sophisticated, thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is not so much, but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off, you lendings. Come, unbutton here. Prithee, Nuncle, be contented. Tis a naughty night to swim in. Now, a little fire in a wild field, or like an old lepter's heart, a small spark, all the rest of his body cold. Look, here comes a walking fire. <laughs> this is the foul fiend, Flibbity Gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock. He gives the web and the pin, squints the eye and makes the hair lip, mildews the white wheat and hurts the poor creature of earth. Switthold footed thrice the old. He met the nightmare and her ninefold, bid her alight and her troth plight, and anoint thee, witch, anoint thee. How fares your grace? Uh, what's he? Who's there? What is it you seek? What are you there? Your names? Poor Tom. The deeds, the swimming frog, the toad, the tadpole, the wall newt, and the water. But in the fury of his heart, when the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salads, swallows the old rat and the ditch dog, drinks the green mantle of the standing pool, who is whipped from tithing to tithing and stopped, punished and imprisoned, who have had three suits to his back, six shirts to his body, horse to ride and weapon to wear, but mice and rats and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long years. Beware, my follower. Peace, Smalkin. Peace, thou fiend. What hath your grace no better company? The Prince of Darkness is a gentleman. Modo, he called. And Mahu. Our flesh and blood, my lord, is grown so vile that it doth hate what gets it. Poor, poor Tom's a cold. Go in with me, my duty cannot suffer, to obey in all your daughter's hard commands. Though their injunction be to bar my doors, and let this tyrannous night take hold upon you, yet have I ventured to come seek you out, and bring you where both fire and food is ready. First let me talk with this philosopher. What is the cause of thunder? Good, my lord, take you suffer. Go into the house. I'll talk a word with this same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin. Let me ask you one word in private. Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Can't thou blame him? His, da <laughs> his daughters seek his death. Ah, oh, that's good Kent. He said it would be thus, poor banished man. Thou sayst the king grows mad. I'll tell thee, friend, I am amongst mad myself. I had a son, now outlawed from my blood. He sought my life, but lately, very late, I love him. Friend, no father, his son dear, dear, dear. Truth to tell thee. The grief hath crazed my wit. What a night's this to live. I do beseech your grace. Oh, cry your mercy, sir. Uh, noble philosopher, your company. Tom's a cold. In fellow, there into thy hovel. Keep thee warm. Come, let's in all. This way, my lord. Uh, with him, I, I will still keep still with the philosopher. My lord, soothe him. Let him take the fellow. Take him, you on. Sirrah, come on. Go along with us. Come, good Athenian. No words, no words. Hush. Charles Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still fifo and fun. I smell the blood of a British man. I will have my revenge ere I depart his house.
Edmund. Well, Edmund's frozen. Oh. He's gone. We'll, we'll read on. I'll read. I'll read Edmund's part. Oh no! Oh no! We're back. No, we're back. We're okay. back. Edmund, how malicious? Oh, how my lord? I may be censored, but not curses gives me to loyalty. Some things fears me to think of. I now perceive it was not altogether your brother's evil disposition made him seek his death, but a provoking merit set a work by a reprovable badness in himself. How malicious is my fortune, so that I must repent to be just. This is a letter which is spoke of, which approves him an intelligent party to the advantages of France. Oh, heavens, that is treason, where not, or not in the delector. Go with me to the Duchess. If the matter of this paper be certain, you have mighty business in hand. True or false, it hath made thee Earl of Gloucester. Seek out where thy father is, that he may be ready for our apprehension. If I find him comforting the king, it will stuff his suspicion more fully. I will persevere in my course of loyalty, though the conflict be sore between that and my blood. I will lay my trust upon thee, and thou shalt find a dearer father in my love. Here is a better than the open air. Take it thankfully. I will pierce out the comfort with what addition I can. I will not be long from you. All the power of his wits have given way to his impatience. The gods reward your kindness. Atoretto calls me and tells me Nero, Nero is an angler in the leak of darkness. Pray, innocent, and beware the foul fiend. Good evening, uncle. Tell me whether a madman be a gentleman or a yeoman. A king! A king! <laughs> no, he's a yeoman that has a gentleman to his son. He's a mad yeoman that sees his son a gentleman before him. To have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in upon him. The foul fiend bites my back. He's mad that trusts in the tameness of a wolf, a horse's health, a boy's love, or a whore's oath. It shall be done. I will arraign them straight. Uh, come, sit thou here, most learned justicia. Uh, thou sapient, sir, sit here. Now, you she foxes. Look where he stands and glares. Wants thou eyes at trial, madam? Come over, born Betty to me. Her boat hath a leak, and she must not speak, why she dares to come over to thee. Foul fiend, halt, poor Tom. In the voice of a, nating, a nightingale. Hop and dance cries in Tom's belly for two white herring. Croak not, black angel. I have no food for thee. How do you, sir? Stand you not so amazed? Will you lie down and rest upon the cushions? I'll steal your trial first. Bring in the evidence. Thou, robed man of justice, take thy place. And thou, his yoke fellow of equity, bench by his side. You are in the commission. Sit you too. Let us deal justly. Sleepest or wakest thou, jolly shepherd, thy sheep beyond the corn, and for one blast of thy minikin mouth, thy sheep shall take no harm. <laughs> that is great. Arraign her first. Tis gone a riddle. I here take my oath before this honourable assembly. She kicked the poor king, her father. I'm here the mistress. Is your name Goneril? She cannot deny it. Cry you mercy. I took you for a joint stool. And here's another, whose warped looks proclaim what store her heart is made on. Stop her there. Arms, arms, sword, fire, corruption in the place. False justicia. Why hast thou let her escape? Less thy five wits. No pity. Sir, where is the patience now that thou so oft have boasted to retain? My dears begin to take this part so much. They'll mar my counterfeiting. 
Oh, the little dogs and all. Trey, Blanche, sweetheart. Oh, see, they bark at me. Mom will throw his head at them. I want you, curs. Tooth that poisons if it bite. Mastiff, greyhound, mongol grim, hound or spaniel, br br brack or him, bobtail, tyke or trundle tail. Tom will make them weep and wail. For with throwing thus my head, dogs leap the hatch, and all are fled. Be thy mouth or black or white. Dodi, dodi, sese. Come, march to wakes and fairs and market towns. Poor Tom, thy horn is dry. Then let them atomize Regan. See what breeds about her heart. Is there any cause in nature that makes these hard hearts? You, sir, I entertain you for one of my hundred. Only I do not like the fashion of your garments. You will say they are Persian attire, but let them be changed. Now, good my lord, lie here and rest a while. Make no noise. Make no noise. Draw the curtains. So, so. We'll go for supper in the morning. So, so. I'll go to bed at noon. Come hither, friend. Where's the king, my master? He is, sir, but trouble him not. His wits are gone. Good friend, I prithee take him in thy arms. I have owed a plot of death upon him. There is a little, there is a little ready. Lay him in it and drive towards Dover. Friend, where thou shalt meet, both welcome and protection. Take up thy master, if thou shouldst daily half an hour, his life with thine and all that offer to defend him. Stand an assured loss. Take up, take up and follow me. That will to some provision give thee quick conduct. Oppressed nature sleeps, this rest might yet have balmed thy broken sinews, which, if convenience will not allow, stand in hard cure. Come, help to bear thy master, thou must not stay behind. Come, come away. When we are but as sea bearing our woes, we scarcely think our miseries our foes. Who alone suffers, suffers most in the mind, leaving three things and happy shows behind. But then the mind much sufferance doth her skip when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. How light and portable my pain seems now when that which makes me bend my, when that which makes me bend makes the king bow. He childed as I fathered. Tom away. Mark the high noises and thyself beray. When false opinion, whose wrong thought defiles thee, in thy just proof repeals and reconciles thee. What will hap more tonight, to escape the king? Lurk, lurk. Post speedily to my lord, your husband, show him this letter. The army of France is landed. Seek out the traitor, Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. eyes. Sorry. Leave him to my displeasure. Edmund, keep you our sister company. The revenges we are bound to take upon your traitorous father are not fit for your beholding. Advise the Duke where you are going to a most festinate preparation. We are bound to the like. Our posts shall be swift and intelligence betwixt us. Farewell, dear sister. Farewell, my lord of Gloucester. How now? Where's the king? My lord of Gloucester hath conveyed him hence, some five or six and thirty of his knights. Hot questress after him, met him at gate, who with some other of the lord's dependents are gone with him towards Dover, where they boast to have him have well-armed friends. Get horses for your mistress. Farewell, sweet lord and sister. Edmund, farewell. Go seek the traitor, Gloucester. Pinion him like a thief. Bring him before us. Though well we may not pass upon his life without the form of justice, yet our power 
shall do a curtsy to our wrath, which men may blame, but not control. Who's there? The traitor? Ingrateful fox, tis he. Bind fast his corky arms. What mean your graces? Good my friends, consider you are my guest. Do me no foul play, friends. Bind him, I say. Hard, hard, oh filthy traitor. Unmerciful lady, as you are, I I'm none. To this chair bind him, villain, thou shalt bind. By the kind gods, tis most ignorantly done to pluck me by the beard. So white and such a traitor. Naughty lady, these hairs which thou dost ravish from my chin, which quicken and accuse thee, I am your host, with robber's hands my hospitable favours. You should not ruffle thus. What will you do? Come, sir, what letters had you late from France? Be simple answered, for we know the truth. And what confederacy have you with the traitors late-footed in the kingdom? To whose hands you have sent the lunatic king. Speak. I have a letter, guessing me sent down, which came from one that's of a neutral heart, and not from one opposed. Cunning. And false. Where hast thou sent the king? To Dover. Wherefore to Dover? Wast thou not charged at peril? Wherefore to Dover? Let him first answer that. I am tied to the state, and I must stand the court. Wherefore to Dover, sir? Because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes, nor thy fierce sister in his anointed flesh stick forish fang. The sea would stuck a storm as his bare head in hell black night endured, would have buoyed up and quenched the steeled fires. Yet poor old heart, he, he hoped, and the heavens to reign. If wolves had a, thy gate howled that a stern time, thou should have said, Good porter, turn the key, and cool their sub subscribe. But I shall see the winged vengeance overtaken such children. See it shalt thou never. Fellows, hold the chair. Upon these eyes of thine, I'll set my foot. He that will think to live till he be whole, old, give me some help. Pluck out his eye. Ah! <laughs> oh, cruel! Oh, you gods! One side will mock another, the other two. If you see vengeance! Servant, um, Hold your hand, my lord! I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have I never done you than now to bid you hold. How now, you dog? If you did wear a beard upon your chin, I'd shake it in, on the squirrel. What do you mean? My villain, draw and fight! Nay, what? Nay then, come on and take the ch chance of anger. Give me thy sword. A peasant stand up thus. <laughs> oh, I am slain. Oh. My lord, I have one eye left to see some mischief on him. Oh, I'm dead. I was dying. <laughs> oh. Lest it see more, prevent it. Out, smile, Jenny! <laughs> Where is thy luster now? <laughs> oh, all dark and comfortless. Where's my son, Edmund? Edmund, enkindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Thou treacherous villain, thou caused on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my foils, that Edgar was absurd. Kind gods, forgive me that and prosper him. Go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover. <laughs> How is my lord? How look you? I have received a hurt. 
follow me, lady. Turn out that eyeless villain. Throw this slave upon the dunghill. Regan, I, I, I bleed apace. Untimely comes this hurt. Give me your arm. Can I be the second servant? Put my hat on. Couple of servants. I'll never care what wickedness I do if this man come to good. If she live long and in the end meet the old course of death, women will all turn monsters. Let's follow the old earl and get the bedlam to lead him where he would. His roguish madness allows itself to anything. Oh thou, I'll fetch some flax and whites of eggs to apply to his bleeding face. Now heaven help him. Oh, I'll say again. <laughs> Yet better thus, and known to be contended, than still contemned and flattered, to be worse, the lowest and most dejected thing of fortune stands still in esperance, lives not in fear. The lamentable, the lamentable change is from the best. The worst returns to laughter. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial air that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown unto the worst owes nothing to thy blasts. But who comes here? My father, poorly led. World, oh world, but that thy strange mutations make us hate thee, life would not yield to age. Oh, my good lord, I have been your tenant and your father's tenant these four score years. Away, get thee away, good friend, be gone, thy comforts can do me no good at all. These they may hurt. You cannot see your way. I have no way, and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw, full of it tis that seen. Our means secure us, and our mere defects prove our commodities. O oh, dear son Edgar, the food of thy absurd father's wrath, might I but live to see these in my touch, I'd say I had eyes again. Oh now, who's there? Oh, God. Who is, can say I am the worst? I am worse than e'er I was. His poor mad Tom. And worse I may be yet. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Fellow, where ghost? It's a beggar man. Mad and beggar too. He has some reason, else he could not beg. I last night storm. I such fellows saw, which made me think a man a worm. My son came then into my mind, and yet my mind was then scarce friend with him. I have heard more since. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. They kill us for their sport. How should this be? Bad is the trade that must play fool to sorrow. Angering itself and others. Bless thee, master. Is that the naked fellow? Uh, aye, my lord. Then, prithee, get thee gone. It, for my sake, thou wilt overtake us hence a mile or twain. I way toward Dover. Do it for ancient love, and bring some covering for this naked soul, which I'll entreat to lead me. Alack, sir, he, he is mad. Tis the time plague where madmen lead the blind. Do as I bid thee, or rather, do thy pleasure above the rest be gone. I'll bring him the best parallel that I have. Come on, what will? Sure, our naked fellow. Poor oh, thumbs are cold. I cannot do a bit further. Come hither, fellow. Yes, I must. Bless thy sweet eyes. They, they bleed. Knowest thou the way to Dover? Both style and gate, horseway and path. Poor Tom hath been scared out of his good wits. Bless thee, Godman's son, from the foul fiend. Five fiends have been in poor Tom at once. Of lust, as a bidicut, of Prince of Dumbness, 
Mahu of stealing. Modo of murder. Uh, uh, Flipper to gibbet of mopping and mowing. Since possesses chambermaids and waiting women. Bless thee, master. Here, take this purse, thou whom the heavens plague have humbled you all stroke that I am wretched. Make thee uh, the happier. Heaven still so still. Let the super flow flowers and loves dieted man that slaves your uh, uh, ordinance that will not see because he doth not feel. Feel your power quickly so distribution should undo excess. And each man have enough. Dost thou know Dover? I, master. There is a cliff whose high and bending head looks fearfully in the confined deep. Bring me but to the very brim of it, and I'll repair the, the misery thou dost bear with something rich about me. From that place I shall no leading need. Give me thy arm, poor Tom shall lead thee. Welcome, my lord. I marvel our mild husband not met us on the way. Now, where's your master? Madam, within, but never man so changed. I told him of the army that was landed. He smiled at it. I told him you were coming. His answer was, the worse. Of Gloucester's treachery and of the loyal service of his son, when, when I informed him, then he called me sot and told me I had turned the wrong side out. What most he should dislike seemed pleasant to him. What like offensive. Then shall you go no further. It is the cowish terror of his spirit that dares not undertake. He'll not feel wrongs that tie him to an answer. Our wishes on the way may pr prove effects. Back, Edmund, to my brother. Hasten his musters and conduct his powers. I must change names at home and give the distaff, and give the distaff into my husband's hands. This trusty servant shall pass between us. Ere long you were like to hear, if you dare venture on your own behalf, a mistress command, wear this, spare speech. Decline your head. This kiss, if it does speak, durst speak, would stretch thy spirits into the air. Oh, conceive and fare thee well. I think we've lost Edmund. Oh, sorry, he's asking to come back in. There you go, he's back in again. Edmund, sorry. receive this kiss. Mwah. Conceive and fare thee well. Sorry, just, just kissed Edmund. Sorry, that? Act four, scene oh, two, yeah. page two. Yeah. It's my... Yours in the ranks of death, Edmund. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. Uh... Yours in the ranks of death. Uh, yes, I just... Yours, yours in the ranks of death. My most dear Gloucester. Oh, the difference of a man and a man. To thee a woman's services are due. My fool usurps my body. Madam, here comes my lord. I have been worth the whistle. Oh, God, all, you are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. I fear your disposition. That nature which contemns its origin cannot be bordered certain in itself. She that herself will slither and dip this branch from her material sap perforce must wither and come to deadly use. No more. The text is foolish. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. Built savour but themselves. What have you done? Tigers, not daughters. What have you performed? A father and a gracious aged man whose reverence even the head-lugged bear would lick. Most Barbarous, most degenerate, have you madded? Could my good brother suffer you to do it? A man, a prince by him so benefited? 
if that the heavens do not their visible spirit send quickly down to tame these vile offenses. It will come humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. Milk livid man that best a cheek for blows, a head for wrongs. Who hast not in thy brow and eye discerning thy honour from thy suffering? That not knowest fools do thy villains pity who are punished. Uh, they have done their mischief. Where's thy drum? France spreads his banners in a noiseless land. With plumed helm thy states begins to threat. Whilst thou, a moral fool, sit still and cries, Alack, why does he so? Be thyself! Devil, proper deformity seems not in the fiend, so horrid as in woman. O oh, vain fool! Thou changed and self-covered thing, for shame! Be monster, not thy feature. Work my fitness to let these hands obey my blood. They are apt enough to dislocate and tear thy flesh and bones. However, thou art a fiend. A woman's shape doth shield thee. Marry your manhood, Mia. What news? A oh, good my lord, the Duke of Cornwall's dead, slain by his servant, going to put out the other eye of Gloucester. Gloucester's eyes? A servant that he bred, thrilled with remorse, opposing against the act, bending his sword to his great master, who thereat, enraged, flew on him, and amongst them felled him dead but not without that harmful stroke which since hath plucked him after. This shows you are above you, Justices, that these are nether crimes so speedily can venge. But, oh, poor Gloucester, lost he his other eye? Both, both, my lord. This letter, madam, craves a speedy answer. It is from your sister. One way, I like this well. But being widow and my Gloucester with her, may all the building and my fancy pluck upon my hateful life. Another way the news is not so tart. I'll read an answer. Where was his son when they did take his eyes? Come with my lady hither. He is not here. No, my good lord, I met him back again. Knows he the wickedness? I, my good lord, t'was he informed against him and quit the house on purpose that their punishment might have the freer course. Gloucester, I live to thank thee for the love thou showest the king, and to revenge thine eyes. Come hither, friend, tell me what more thou knowest. Why, the king of France is so suddenly gone back. Know you the reason? Something he left imperfect in the state, which since his coming forth is thought of, which imports to the kingdom so much fear and danger that his personal return was most required and necessary. Who hath he left behind him, General? The Marshal of France, Monsieur Lafarge. Did your letters pierce the Queen to any demonstration of grief? Aye, sir. She took them, read them in my presence, and now, then an ample tear trilled down her delicate cheek. It seems she was a queen over her passion, who, most rebel-like, sought to be king over her. Oh, then he moved her. Not to a rage. Patience and sorrow strove. Who could express her goodliest? You have seen sunshine and rain at once. Her smiles and tears were like a better way. Those happy smilets that played on her ripe lip seemed not to know what guests were in her eyes, which parted thence as pearls from diamonds dropped. In brief... Sorrow would be a rarity most beloved if all could so become it. Made she no verbal question. Faith, once or twice, she heaved the name of father, panting forth as it pressed her heart, cried, Sisters, sisters, shame of ladies, sisters, Kent, fathers, sisters, what's in the storm, the night, let pity not be believed. There she shook the holy water from her heavenly eyes and clamour moistened. Then away she started to deal her grief alone. It is the stars, the stars above us, govern our conditions. Else one self-mate and mate could not forget such different issues. You spoke not with her since. No. Was this before the king returned? No, since. Well, sir, the poor distress leers in the town, who sometime in his better tune remembers 
what we are come about, and by no means will yield to seek his daughter. Why, good sir? A sovereign shame so elbows him. His own unkindness has stripped her from his benediction, turned her to foreign casualties, gave her dear rights to his dog-hearted daughters. These things sting his mind so venomously that burning shame detains him from Cordelia. Alack, poor gentleman. Of Albany's and Cornwall's powers you heard not? Tis so, there are afoot. Well, sir, I'll bring you to our master Lear and leave you to attend him. Some dear cause will in concealment wrap me up a while. When I am known aright, you shall not grieve, lending me this acquaintance. I pray you go along with me. Back is he. Why he is met even now as mad as the vexed sea, singing aloud, crowned with rank firmator and furrow weeds, with burdocks, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, arnel, and all the idle weeds that grow in our sustaining corn. A century send forth, search every acre in the high grown field and bring him to our eye. What can man's wisdom in the restoring his bereaved sense? He that helps him takes all my outward worth. There is means, madam. Our foster nurse of nature is repose, so which he lacks, that to provoke in him are many simple operatives whose power will close the eye of anguish. All blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth spring from mine eyes. Be aidant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him. Lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. News, madam, the British powers are marching hitherward. It was known before. Preparation stands in expectation of them. Oh, dear father, it is thy business that I go about. Therefore, great France, my mourning and inopportune fears hath pitied. No blown ambition doth our arms incite. Love, dear love, at our aged father's right. Soon may I hear and see him. But are my brother's powers set forth? Aye, madam. Himself in person there? Madam, with much ado, your sister. He's the better soldier. Lord Edmund spake not with your lord at home? No, madam. What might import my sister's letter to him? I know not, lady. Faith, he is posted hence on serious matter. It was great ignorance, Gloucester's eyes being out to let him live. Where he arrives, he moves all hearts against us. Edmund, I think, is gone in pity of his misery to dispatch his knighted life. Nor over to descry the strength of the enemy. I must need after him, madam, with my letter. Our troops set forth tomorrow. Stay with us. The ways are dangerous. I may not, madam. My lady charged my duty in this business. Why should she write to Edmund? Might not you transport her purposes by word? The like, some things. I know not what. I love thee much. Let me unseal the letter. Madam, I had rather- I know your lady does not love her husband. <laughs> I'm sure of that. And at her late being here, she gave strange oyards and most speaking looks to noble Edmund. I know you are of her bosom. I, madam? I speak in understanding. You are. I know it. Therefore, I do advise you, take this note. My lord is dead. Edmund and I have talked. And more convenient is he for my hand than for your ladies. You may gather more. If you do find him, pray you give him this. And when your mistress hears thus much from you, I pray desire her, call her wisdom to her. So fare you well. If you do chance to hear of that blind traitor, preferment falls on him that cuts him off. Would I could meet him, madam. I should show what party I do follow. Fare thee well. Oxter. When shall we come to the top of the same hill? You do climb it up it now. Look. How we labour? He thinks the ground is even. A horrible steep. Huck, do you hear the sea? No, Trudy. Why then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes' anguish. So may it be indeed. Methinks 
thy voice is altered, and thou speakest in better phrase, and matter than thou didst. Oh, you're much deceived. In nothing am I changed, but in my garments. Methinks you are better spoken. Come on, sir. Here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one eye so low. The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as... Halfway down hangs one that ga gathers samphire. Dreadful trade. You think he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock. Her cock a boy almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebbles chase cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon, I would not leap upright. Let go of my hand. Here, friend. Here's another purse. In it a jewel, well worth a poor man's taking. There is in God's prosper it with thee. Go thou further off, bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Now, fare you well, good sir. With all my heart. Is there a problem? So as Edgar moves aside, then you continue. Yeah, okay, fine. I just can't hear anything. Um, Why trifled us with his despair is done to cure it. O oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce, and in your sight shake patiently my great affliction off. If I could bear it longer and not fall, to quarrel with your great apost apostles, Willis, my snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. If Edgar live, I bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. Gone, sir. Farewell. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought, by this hand thought, by this had thought been passed. Alive or dead? Oh, you, sir, friend, hear you, sir? Speak. Thus might he pass indeed. But he revives. What are you, sir? Away and let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gotten all, feathers, air, so many fathoms down precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance, beats not, speaks, but sound. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou thy past perpendicularly fell. Thy life's a miracle. Speak yet again. But have I fallen or no? Ah, oh, from the dread summit of this chalky bourne. Look up a height. The shrill gorge lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Alack, I have no eye. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit? To its end itself by death. Twas yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. Give me your arm. Up, ah, so. How is't? For your legs? You stand. Too well, too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns welked and waved like the enraged sea. It was some fiend. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honours of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. I do remember now, henceforth I bear affliction till it do cry out itself. Enough, enough, and die, that thing you speak of. I took it for man, for a man, often, could say, 
a theme, a theme he led me to that place. They're free and patient thoughts. But who comes here? The safer sense will ne'er accommodate his master thus. No, they cannot touch me for coming. I am the king himself. Oh, thou side-piercing sight. Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace. This piece of toasted cheese will do it. Mm, there's my gauntlet. <laughs> I'll prove it on a giant. Bring up the brown hills. Ooh, well-flown bird. In the clout, in the clout. Ooh, give me the word. Sweet marjoram. Oz. I know. Gloucester. I know that voice. I'll carry on. Ah, oh, Goneril with a white one. beard. Thank you. Ah, oh, Goneril with a white beard. Ha, oh, vegan. <laughs> they flattened me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard. Yeah, the black ones were there. To say I and no to everything I said and I to no to was no good of it, divinity. And the rain came to wet me once and the wind to make me chatter. When the thunder would not peace at my bidding, there I found them. There I smelt them out. Go to, they are not men of the words. They told me I was everything. Tis I lie. I am not argued with. The trick of that voice, I do well remember. Is the, not the king? I every inch a king. And I do stare. See how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery? Thou shalt not die. Die for adultery? No. The wren goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecture in my sight. Let copulation thrive, for Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughters got tween the lawful sheets. To it, luxury, pell-mell, for I lack soldiers. Behold yon simpering dame whose face between her forks presages snow. That minces virtue and does shake the head, the hair, a peer of pleasure's name. The fitchu, nor the soiled horse, goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist there are centaurs, there are women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulphurous pit. Burning, scalding, stench, consumption. Bye, bye, bye. Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary, to sweet my imagination. There's money for thee. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Over in peace of nature, this great world shall so wear out to naught. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough, dost thou squiny at me? No, oh, do thy worst, blind Cupid. I'll not love. Read thou this challenge? Mark with the penning of it. Were all thy letters son, I could not see one. I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Let me. Oh, sorry, that's you. That makes more sense. Yes. Go. <laughs> Read. What with the case of eyes? <coughs> oh, ho, oh, are you here, there with me? No eyes in your head, nor no money in your purse. Your eyes are in a heavy case. <laughs> your purse in a light. <laughs> you see how this world goes. I see it freeing me. Freeing me. What, up, man? A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Um, see how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear, change places and handy dandy. Which is the justice? Which is the thief? 
Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar? Aye, sir. <clears throat> and the creature run from the cur? There thou mightest behold the great image of authority. A dog's obeyed in office, thou rascal beadle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back, thou hotly lustest to use her in that kind for which thou whipst her. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes, great vices to appear, robes and furred gowns hide all. Plates sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Arm it in rags, a pygmy straw does pierce it. None does offend. None, I say. None. I'll able them. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician, steam to see the things thou dost not. Now. Now, now, pull off my boots. Harder, harder, harder. So. Some matter and impertinency mixed. Reason in madness. If thou wilt keep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. He came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee. Mark me. Alack, alack, the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. This is a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. <laughs> I'll put it to proof. And when I've sown upon these sons-in-law, then kill, 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 kill. <coughs> oh, here he is. Lay hand upon him. So your most dear daughter... No rescue, but a prisoner. <coughs> I'm even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well, you shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons. I'm cut to the brains. You shall have anything. No seconds, all myself. Why would make a man of man of salt to use his eyes for garden water pots? I am laying autumn's dust. Good sir. I will die bravely like a smug bridegroom. What I will I will be jovial. Come, come. I am a king, my masters. Now you know that. You are a royal one, and we obey you. And there's life in it. Come, and if you get it, you shall get it by running. <laughs> a sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast a daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought her to. Hail, gentle sir. Sir, speed you. What's your will? You hear aught uh, of a battle toward? Most sure and vulgar. Everyone hears that can distinguish sound. But, by your favour, how near's the other army? Near, and on speedy foot. The main dusk cry stands in the hourly thought. I thank you, sir. That's all. Though that the Queen on special causes here, her army is moved on. I thank you, sir. You ever, gentle gods, take my breath from, from me. Let not my words, spirit, tempt me again to die before you please. Well pray you, father. Now, good sir, what are you? A most poor man made tame to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows, am pregnant to good pity. Give me your hand. I'll lead you to some biding. Hearty thanks, the bounty and the venison of heaven, to boot and boot. A proclaimed prize, most happy, that I as head of thine was first framed flesh to raise my fortunes. Thou old unhappy traitor, briefly thyself remember, the sword is out that must destroy thee. Now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to... It. Wherefore, bold peasant, dost thou suppose a published traitor? Does, dost thou support a published traitor? Hence, lest that infection of his fortune take like hold on thee. Let go his arm. Shall not let go, sir, without verza occasion. Let go, slave, or thou diest. Good gentlemen, go your gate, and let Paul Volt pass, and should have been swaggered out of my life, could not have been so long as this by what night. Nay. 
come not near the old man. Keep out, Chevoyer, or, or I try whether you custard or my bellow be the harder. Chill be plain with you. Out, Stonghill! Chill, pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter for your fine. Slain? Thou hast slain me? Villain, take my piece, my purse. If ever thou wilt fry, bury my body and give the letters which thou findest about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the British party. Oh, untimely death. I know you well. A serviceable villain. As duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. What is he dead? Put you down, father. Rest you. Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He's dead. I'm only sorry that he had no others, no other deaths, man. Let us see. Leave gentle wax and manners. Blame us not. Know our enemies' minds. We rip their hearts. Their papers is more lawful. <clears throat> Let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut them off. If your will want not, time and place will be fruitfully offered. There is nothing done if he return the conqueror. Deny him the prisoner and his bed, my jail, from the loathed warmth whereof deliver me, and supply the place for your labour. Your wife, so I would say, affectionate servant, and for you her own venture, Goneril. Oh, indistinguished space of woman's will. A plot upon her virtuous husband's life. And the exchange, my brother. Here in the sands, the I'll rake up the post unsanctified of murderous lectures. And in the mature time, with this ungracious paper, strike the sight of the death practice, Duke. For him, tis well that of thy death and bitterness I can tell. The king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenuous feelings of my huge sorrow. Better I were distracted, so should my thoughts be severed from my grief and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Give me your hand, give me your hand. Far off, methinks I hear the beaten drum. Come, father, I'll bestow you with a friend. Oh, thou good Kent. How shall I live and work to match thy goodness? My life will be too short, and every measure fail me. To be acknowledged, madam, is o'erpaid. All my reports go with the modest truth, nor more, nor clipped, but so. Be better suited. These weeds are memories of those worser hours. I prithee, put them off. Pardon, dear madam, yet to be known shortens my made intent. My boon I make it that you know me not, till time and I think meet. And be it so, my good lord. How does the king? Madam, sleep still. Oh, you kind God, cure this great breach in this abused nature. Untuned and jarring senses. Oh, wind up of this child-changed father. So please, your majesty, that we may wake the king. He hath slept long. Be governed by your knowledge, and proceed in the sway of your own will. Is he arrayed? Someone? Aye, madam, in the heaviness of sleep, we put fresh garments on him. Be by, good madam, when we do awake him, I doubt not of his temperance. Very well. Please you draw near. Louder the music there. Oh, my dear father, restoration hang thy medicine on my lips, and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kind indeed, princess. Had you not been their father, these white flakes did challenge pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds? To stand against the deep, dread-bolted thunder in the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick-cross lightning? To watch, poor Purdue, 
with this thin helm. Mine enemy's meanest dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. And wast thou fain, poor father, to hovel thee with swine and rogues lawn in short and musty straw? Alack, alack, it is wonder that thy life and wits at once had not concluded all. He wakes, speak to him. Madam, do you, tis fittest. How does my royal lord? How fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Sir, you know me. You are a spirit. I know. Where did you die? Still, still far wide. He's scarce awake. Let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight. I am mightily abused. I should even die with pity to see another thus. I know not what to say. I will not swear these on my hands. Let's see. I, I, I feel this pinprick. But I were assured of my condition. Look upon me, Father. Look upon me, sir. Hold your hands in benediction o'er me. No, sir, you must not kneel. Pray, do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Fourscore and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. <laughs> do, do, do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I, I think this lady to be my child Cordelia. And so I am, I am. Oh, be your tears wet. Yes, faith, I pray, weep not. <laughs> If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause. No cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. And yet it is danger to make him even o'er the time he has lost. Desire him to go in. Trouble him no more till further second. Will it please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now, f forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. Hold it true, sir, that the Duke of Cornwall was so slain? Most certain, sir. Who is the conductor of his people? Ah, as you said, the bastard son of Oscar. They say Edgar, his banished son, is with the other people in Germany. The report is changeable. It is time to look about. The powers of the kingdom approach the fate. The arbitrament is like to be bloody. Very well, sir. My point in period will be truly wrought, or well or ill, as he stays battle for. Um, 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 uh. No, of the Duke, if his last purpose ought, or whether since he is advised by oath to change the course, he is full of alternation, and self reproving bring his constant pleasure. Our sister's man is certainly miscarried. It is to be dubbed, madam. Now, sweet lord, you know the goodness I intend upon you. Tell me but truly, and then speak the truth. Do you not love my sister? In honored, loved. But have you never found my brother's way to the forfended place? That suits the boost you. I am doubtful that you have been conjunct and bosomed with her as far as we call hers. No, by mine honor, madam. I never shall endure her. 
Dear my lord, being not familiar with her. Fear me not. She and the duke, her husband. Goneril. Oh, Goneril's frozen. Oh no. Wake up, Goneril. <laughs> We're almost finished. <laughs> I had rather lose the Yeah, hello. Ah, okay, one gone roll. I had rather lose the battle than lose <laughs> me. <laughs> Our very loving sister will be met. So this I hear. The king has come to his daughter with others whom the rigor of our state forced to cry out. Where I could not be honest, I never yet was valiant. For this business, it touches us as France invades our land. Not bold the king, with whom, with others whom I fear most just and heavy causes make oppose. Sir, you speak nobly. Why is this reason? Combined together against the enemy, for, the, for these domestic and particular broils are not the question here. Let's then determine with the ancient of war on our proceeding. I shall return you presently at your tent. Sister, you'll go with us? No. It is most convenient. Pray you, go with us. Oh, I know the riddle. I will go. Charlie disguised. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Need a hat. <laughs> Uh, if ever your grace had speech with man so poor, hear me one word. I'll, I'll overtake you. Speak. Speak. Okay. It's Albany. Yeah. yeah, I'll overtake you. Speak. Before you fight the battle, open this letter. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound for him that brought it. Wretched though I seem, I can produce a champion that will prove what is avouched there. If you miscarry, your business of the world hath so an end, and machination ceases. Fortune love you. Stay till I read the letter. I was forbid it. When time shall serve, but let the hell cry. And I'll appear again. Why, fare thee well. I will o'erlook thy paper. The enemies in view, draw up your powers. Here is the guess of their true strengths and forces. By diligent discovery, but your ace is now urged on you. We will greet the time. To both these sisters have I sworn my law. Each jealous of the other as tongue are of the other. Which of them shall I take? Both one or neither. Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the window exasperates, makes mad her sister Gonorrhea. An hardy child I carry out my side, her husband being alive. Now then we will, uh, we will ask his countenance for the battle, which being done. Better who would be right of him device is pity taking off. As for the mercy which he intends to Lear and to Cordelia, the battle done on the window outpour or power shall never see his pardon. For my state stands on me to defend, not to debate. <laughs> Dear Father, take the shadow of this tree for your good host. Pray that the right may fly, thrive. If ever I return to again, I'll bring you comfort. Please go with you, sir. Away, old man. Give me thy hand. Away. <laughs> King Lear hath lost, he and his daughter taken. Give me thy hand. Come on. No further, sir. A man may not 
They look even here. What? In ill thoughts again? Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Rightness is all. Come on. And that's true too. Some officer, some officers take them away. Good guards, until their greater pleasures first be known, that are to censure them. We are not the first who is best meaning have incurred the worst. Thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else outfrown false fortune's frown. Will we not see these daughters and these sisters? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. No. Oh! Come. That's a way to prison. <laughs> We two alone will sing like birds in the cage when thou dost ask me blessing. I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. <clears throat> and we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, and who's in and who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies. We'll wear out in a walled prison, packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Take them away. Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. Have I caught thee? He that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven and fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes, the good years shall devour them, flesh and fail. There they shall make us weep. We'll starve and we'll see them starve first. Come, Come I your captain. Hark. Take thou these notes. Go for them to prison. One step I have advanced thee. If thou dost as this instructs thee. Thou dost make thy way to noble fortunes. Know thou this, that men are as the time is. To be determined, thus to become a sword. Thy great employment will not bear question. Either say thou do it, or, or shrive by other means. I'll, I'll do it, my lord. <laughs> but it, and write happy when those done. Mark, I say, instantly, and carry it so, as I have set it down. I cannot draw a cart, nor eat dried oats. If it be man's work, I'll do it. Sir, you have showed today your valiant strength, and fortune led you well. You have the captives who were the opposites of this day's strife. We do require them of you, so to use them as we should, should find their merits and our safety may equally determine. Sir, I thought it fit them the old and miserable king to some retention and appointing guard, whose age has charms in it, whose title bore, who plunged the common bosom on his side and turned or impressed lances in our eyes which to command them. With him I sent the queen my reason all the same, and they are ready tomorrow or at further space to appear when you shall hold your session. Your session. At this time we sweat and bleed. The friend has lost his friend, and the best quarrels in the heat are cursed by those that feel their sharpness. The question of Cordelia and her father requires a fitter place. Sir, by your patience, I hold you but a subject of this war, not as a brother. That's as we list to grace him. Methinks our pleasure might have been demanded ere you had spoke so far. He led our powers for the commission of my place and person. The witch immediacy may well stand up and call itself your brother. Not so hot. In his own grace, he doth exalt himself more than in your edition. In my right, by me invested, he compares the best.
Got that, yeah. Most of these shall Albany. Albany. That one merged. Albany? Who's Albany? I'm Albany. I haven't got a line there. Okay. Oh. That, that were the most of he. Oh, have we got a difference? Yeah, that were the most of he. Well, I've got Goneril saying that. Anyway, oh. I'll, okay. that were the most of he should husband you. Jesters do oft prove prophets. Is it Albany? Okay. I that told you oh, yeah. looked but a squint. Lady, I am not well, else I should answer from a full flowing stomach. General, take thou my soldiers, prisoners, patrimony, dispose of them, of me. The walls is thine. Witness the world that I create thee here, my lord and master. Mean you to enjoy him then? The let alone lies not in your good will. Nor in vain, lord. Half-blooded fellow, yes. Let the drum strike and prove my title thine. There yet, hear reason. Edmund, I arrest thee on capital treason and in thine attaint this gilded serpent. For your claim, fair sister, I bar it in the interest of my wife. Tis she is subcontracted to this lord and I, her husband, contradict your banes. If you will marry, Make your loves to me. My lady is bespoke. <laughs> An interlude. Thou art armed, Gloucester. Let the trumpet sound. If none appear to prove upon thy person thy heinous, <laughs> manifest, and many reasons, there is my pledge. I'll prove it on thy heart. Here I taste bread. Thou art in nothing less than I have here proclaimed thee. Sick. Oh, sick. If not, I'll ne'er trust medicine. There is my exchange. What in the word is that names me traitor, the link like his lies? Followed by thy trumpet, is that there's approach on him, on you, would not. I will maintain my truth on honor firmly. A herald, ho! A herald, ho! Oh, a herald! Trust to thy single virtue, for thy soldiers, all levied in my name, have in my name took their discharge. My sickness grows upon me. She is not well. Convey her to, to my tent. And at this moment, I'm really sorry. I do have to go. That's all right. We will. So I've, I've pushed it as long as I can. I'm Thank so you, sorry. Monica. <laughs> have an amazing rest of Act Five. Yeah, we're we'll finished. Meet you all. all the Thank best. You. I also to need you. to go, so goodbye. Sorry. That's all right, we'll cover for you. We're almost there. Well done. Thank you. Come hit the herald, let the trumpet sound and read out this. Sound, trumpet, trumpet sound. Sorry. If any man of quality or degree within the lists of the army will maintain upon Edmund, supposed Earl of Gloucester, that he is a manifold traitor, let him appear by the third sound of the trumpet. He is bold in his defense. Come on. Sound. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Ask him his purposes. Why he appears upon this call of the trumpet. What are you, your name, your quality, and why you answer this present summons? Oh, no, my name is lost. By treason's tooth bear known and canker bit. Yet am I noble as the adversary I come to cope with all. Which is that adversary? What's he that speaks for Edmund, Earl of Gloucester? Himself. What says thou to him? Draw thy sword. That if my speech offend a noble heart, thy arm may do thee justice. Mine. Behold, it is the privilege of mine honours, my oath and my profession. I protest, maugre thy strength, youth, place and eminence. Despite thy victor sword and fire new fortune, thy valour and thy heart, thou art a traitor, false to thy gods, thy brother and thy father. Conspirant against this high illustrious prince, and from the extreme top of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Say thou no. This sword, this arm, and my best spirits are bent to prove upon my heart. 
whereto I speak, thou liest. In wisdom, I should ask thy name. But since thy outside looks so fair and worklike, and that thy tongue some say of breeding braces, what safe and nicely I might well delay. By rule of king stood I this day and spurn. Back do I tell these treasons to thy head. With the hell aided lies off will thy earth, which for the yet glance by and scarcely bruise, these words of mine shall give them instant way. Where they shall rest for ever. Trembles, speak. Hello, am I Conroe? Yeah, Conroe? Sorry, 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 Conroe? It can be. Okay. I'll be Conroe. Okay. I've got my. All right, okay. okay. Conroe was his mother in law. This is practice, Gloucester. Do I sound like her? This is practice, Gloucester. <laughs> this is practice, Gloucester. By the laws of arms, thou wast not bound to answer. An unknown opposite, thou art not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled. I've lost my line. <laughs> Shut your mouth. I've taken your breath away. <laughs> your cue is, your line is shut your mouth. Oh yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Shut your mouth, Dane. <laughs> oh, this right paper, shall I stop it? Hold, sir. Thou worse than any name. Read thine own evil. No tearing, lady. I perceive. No tearing, lady. I perceive you know it. Say if I do. The laws are mine, not thine. Who can arraign for me? Most monstrous. Knows thou this, this paper? Ask me not what I know. Go after her. She's desperate. Govern her. What you have charged me with, that I have done, and more, much more. The time will bring it out. This past and so am I. But what are thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou strongs me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where he got, where thee he got, cost him his eyes. So spoken right, this true. So well is come full circle. I am here. Methought the, thy very gate did prophesy a royal nobleness. I must embrace thee. Let sorrow split my heart, if ever did I did hate thee, or thy father. Worthy prince, I, I know it. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my lord. Missed a brief tale, and when tis told, oh, that my heart would burst. The bloody proclamation to escape that followed me so near. Oh, our life's sweetness that we the pain of death would hourly die rather than die at once, taught me to shift into a madman's rags, to assume a semblance that very dogs disowned. And in this habit I met I my father with his bleeding ring, their precious stones new lost, because his guide became his guide, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair. Never, O oh fault, Revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed when I was armoured. Not sure, though hoping of this good success, I asked his blessing and from first to last told him my pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, that too weak the conflict to support, fits two extremes of passion, joy and grief, burst smilingly. This speech of yours has moved me, and shall perchance do good. But speak you on. You look as you had something more to say. If there be more, more woeful, hold it in. 
Well, I'm almost ready to dissolve hearing of this. I think we're all ready to dissolve. <laughs> <laughs> this, would have seemed, there. this would have seemed a period to such as love, not sorrow. But another to, am to, to amplify too much would make much more and top extremity. Whilst I was big in clamour, came there in a man who, having seen me in my worst extent, shunned my abhorred society. But then, finding who twas that so endured, with his strong arms, he fastened on my neck and bellowed out as he burst heaven, threw him on my father, told the most piteous tale of Lear and him that ever ear received which in recounting his grief grew frequent and the strings of life began to crack. Twice then the trumpet sounded and there I left him cast. But who was this? Kent, sir, the banished Kent. Who in disguise followed his enemy king and did him service improper for a slave. Help, help, help. help. Sorry. What, what kind of help? Big man. What means that bloody knife? It is hot. It smokes. It came even from the heart of... Oh, she's dead. Who dead? Speak, man. Your lady, sir. Your lady and her sister. By her poison. She confesses it. I was contracted to them both. All three now marry in an instant. Here comes Kent. Produce their bodies. Be they alive or dead. This judgment of the heavens that makes us tremble touches us not with pity. Oh, is this he? The time will not allow the compliment that very manner urges. I am come to bid my king and my master a good night. Is he not here? Great thing of us forgot. Speak, Edmund. Where's the king? And where's Cordelia? Seest thou this object, Kent? Alack, why thus? Yet <clears throat> Edmund was beloved. The one the other poisoned for my sake, and after slew Ursa. Even so, cover their faces. I pant for life. Some goose I mean to do despite of mine, O nature. Quickly send. Be brief in it. To the castle, for my wit, is on the, li the life of Lear and on Cordelia. May send. Run! Run, oh, run! To whom, my lord? Who hath the office? Send thy token of reprieve. Edmund? I think he's frozen. Well yeah. thought on, take my sword, the captain. Give it the captain. Haste thee for thy life. He hath commissioned from thy wife and me to hang Cordelia in the prison, to lay the blame upon her own despair that she forbid herself. The gods defend her. Bear him the while. Howl, 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 howl. Oh, you are men of stones, had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's fault should crack. crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass, if that her breath will mist or stain the stone. Why then she lives. Is this the promised end? Or oh, image of that horror. Pull and cease. This feather stirs, she lives. Should it be so? It is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. And oh, my good master, prithee away. Tis oh, noble master. Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now she's gone forever. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. Uh, what's thou that sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low, an excellent thing in women. <laughs> I killed the slave that was her hanging thee. Tis true, my lord, he did. Did I not, fellow? I have seen the day with my good biting falcon, falcon, 
I would have made them skip. I am old now, and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? Mine eyes are not the best, I'll tell you straight. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, one of them we beheld. This is a dull sight. Are you not a, are you not Kent? The same. Are you still there, Kent? This <laughs> yes. Your servant, Kent. Where is he? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. He's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike and quickly too. He's dead and rotten. No, my good lord. I am the very man. I'll see that straight. That from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. Well, welcome hither. Yeah, well, 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 dark and deadly, <laughs> your eldest daughters have fordone themselves and desperately are dead. Aye, so I think. He knows not what he says, and vain is it that we present us to him. Very bootless. Edmund is dead, my lord. That's but a trifle here. You lords and noble know our intent. What comfort to this great decay may come shall be applied. For us, we will resign during the life of this old majesty to him, our absolute power. You, to your rights with boot and such addition as your honours have more than merited. All friends shall taste the wages of their virtue and all foes the cup of their deserving. Oh, see, see. And my poor fool is hanged. <laughs> no, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? Oh, thou come no more. Never, 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 never. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her, look on her lips. Look there, look there. Oh, oh, oh. He thinks, my lord, my lord. Break, heart. I pretty break. Look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. Oh, he is gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends of my soul, you twain, rule in this realm and the gored state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. The weight I of must this, not say no. The weight of this weight of time, we right. must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The eldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. Boom. Boom, boom. <laughs> Curtain fall. Voila. Well done, everybody. Uh, well, that was a marathon and a half. Enjoyable. It was enjoyable, yeah. I mean, that the only time I ever saw King Lear, um, most of the actors were played by wooden spoons. <laughs> <laughs> it was about 20 years ago. It was desperately a bridge for about an hour and 20 minutes. Right, so I must go because my parents yeah. have made me dinner. So God bless, Josh. Well, Thank well, you very well, much for your well, well, yes. yeah. um, well, spring. And the last time I saw Stefan Smart here was about 30 years ago. I think we actually studied <laughs> King Lear together, I believe. It. My English teacher. Indeed. Lovely to see you. I, I think it might have been Hamlet. Uh, was it Hamlet? Oh, yeah. yeah probably. Hamlet and Byron, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all the best to everybody.
Good night. 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 All right. Thanks for that, Tom. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. All right. See you, Ferdy. See you. Bye. Hello. I'm still here. Hello, Charlie. That was quite fun, wasn't it? <laughs> I really enjoyed that. That was a great idea. Obviously, there was always going to be difficulties with uh, the sinking and people having to go, but I was really, really happy to have done it, even though, you know, Tough, tough towards the end, but uh, to there's some great in. insults in that play, isn't there? Anyway, the foot, what was it, the blasted footballer or something? <laughs> <laughs> Football player. Uh, anyway, I bet we better go for dinner now. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna go for a run, but and then I will okay, go. Good on you. Okay. All right, God bless. Bye bye. Nice to see you. Bye bye. <laughs>